Today we are continuing our sermon series entitled, I Am Just Saying. And I want to remind you that the I Am part comes from the divine name Yahweh, which God gives to Moses in the burning bush when Moses asks, who should I say has sent me? The just saying, obviously, is a much more contemporary saying, but we put these two together to remind ourselves that these words of the Sermon on the Mount are Jesus' words, being spoken to those who are apprenticed to him, his disciples who have chosen to follow him. Last week, we heard one of the first occurrences of the expression that Jesus uses, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you that Jesus knows those who are listening to him understand the letter of the law. They've seen the Ten Commandments, they've learned them, they've internalized them. But what Jesus wants to do is he wants to take them more deep, much deeper into the meaning and the spirit of the text. Last week, John spoke about murder. Each of us pretty much can nod and say, have not disobeyed that commandment. Good, I can check that on my list. And yet John helped us to see that what Jesus does is takes us deeper into that. And many of us left convicted. Convicted that we too have been complicit in murdering someone with thoughts or words or unresolved issues with another person. We left saying, ouch. Well, the text before us today is another, you have heard it was said, but I tell you, and the message is not any easier. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not really a big fan of window shopping unless I really know I can't afford anything. So on occasion, when we were in eastern Pennsylvania, we would go into New York City to Rockefeller Center, we'd see the tree, we'd walk around all the shops. Not a problem, I can't buy anything anyway. On occasion, we might find ourselves walking the car lots if we're starting to think about needing to replace a car. Not one of my favorite things to do, and I always get nervous when the, the salespeople start you know, navigating from points around. The worst for me is on a hot San Antonio summer afternoon, and I just go to the mall so I can walk around and get some exercise in the cool air conditioning, because I can afford a few things there. And something will catch my eye and it'll draw me to the window or it might draw me just inside the door and then I start getting tempted and I start to wonder and that, that salesperson slides on over and then I've learned very quickly to go just looking. Thanks, thanks, just looking. Doesn't hurt to look, doesn't cost anything to look, right? Just look, don't touch. That's what they told us when we were little. However, in our text today, Jesus is talking about more than just a casual glance. And I want to say to parents with young children, you may need to unpack a little of this when you get home. And parents with teenage children, I want you to unpack this when you get home. The reality is that every one of us knows what it's like from a very young age to see something and to start to want it, even if it is not ours to be had. We all have experienced that. And for some reason, have you found, as I have, that the more, almost more forbidden it is, the more I'm tempted to want to do it? That once we fix our eyes on something, then we start to see, feel our hearts turning toward it, and we start to feel our wills crumbling. So I invite you now, with that warning, to open the scriptures to Matthew chapter 5. As we continue reading Jesus' words to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 27 through 30. Listen to the word of God. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Thanks be to God that this is God's word to us. These are not my words. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks that your word is ever true. And Lord, in this moment, 
We have a sense of this part of your word that cuts through to the truth of issues. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher and our guide as we hear your word to us today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that my husband and my boss are out of town, and this is what I got to preach on. (laughs) Thanks, guys. A key point to remember as we seek to understand this passage and the other passages in which we currently find ourselves in the Sermon on the Mount is something that Trey mentioned a few weeks ago. After he finished the opening sermon of the Beatitudes, he then said, what's about to follow are instructions for the disciples to be able to learn to have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees clearly were saying, we haven't committed murder, we've checked off that commandment. We haven't committed adultery, we can check off that commandment. And yet the reality was it was not uncommon while they held to that seventh commandment, they kind of let the tenth one slide when it came to relationships. The tenth one, for one or two of you that aren't sure which one is the tenth, is you shall not covet anything that is owned by your neighbor. Well, we need to realize that in the ancient world, like it or not, women were essentially the property of the man in their life, their father, their brother, or their husband once they got married. So you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor, included the women in your neighbor's household. So in calling the disciples to see that their righteousness exceeded that of the Pharisees, Jesus is actually calling the disciples to have a whole new view of women. What we see when we look at Jesus' life is he has a different view of women. They are not second-class citizens to him. And further from that, they are not property to be managed, but they are sisters in faith. Jesus models this the three years that he's in ministry. He invites women to come and to speak with him in public. He asks the women and and allows them to come and to travel with him and the disciples. And they even fund some of their mission of preaching and teaching out of their own finances. When one woman is kind of caught in the busyness of the kitchen, Jesus calls her out for it and says, it's better for you to come and sit and be a part of what I'm teaching. And it's that woman who is able to give the highest Christological affirmation of who Jesus is before his death and resurrection in all of recorded New Testament. Martha, busy Martha from the kitchen, is the one who at the tomb of her brother Lazarus says when Jesus says, do you believe? She said, yes, Lord, I believe. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God who was to come into the world. That's Martha. She's one of my favorites. The women were the ones left at the foot of the cross. And it was to the women that the angels came with the great good news that Jesus had risen. So Jesus had relationships with women. He talked to them. He looked at them. He looked them in the eyes. He touched them. He took them by the hand. But all the while, Jesus disciplined his mind and trained his eye as a man, for he was fully man, to look upon them as sisters and not as an object to be desired or grasped. Jesus knew there was a strong connection between what we look at and where our heart goes. That connection goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, where we read about God creating Adam and giving to Adam all the fruit of the trees of the garden, take from any of them, just except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat of it, you will surely die. And then after God gives this instruction to Adam, he then declares it's not good for man to be alone and not finding a suitable Helper amongst all the other creation, God creates woman. I will create a helper for him. This word helper is the same word used throughout the Old Testament to describe God's being the helper to Israel. So you see, God's plan before the fall was equality and partnership between male and female. 
She was not meant to be subservient. She was not created from his foot. She was created from his side to be his partner. But how soon that healthy relationship got distorted. In chapter 3, we see the arrival of the serpent. And the serpent convinces Eve to exchange the truth she knew in her heart for a lie. In verse 6 of chapter 3, we read this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. You know the rest of the story. Everything that was perfect and good in God's creation was then broken and tarnished, not the least of which were the relationships between men and women. It was not just the words of the serpent that tempted Eve to take that apple or that fruit, but it was the fact that she had allowed her gaze to remain on that tree. The scripture was very clear. She looked and saw that it was good. She saw that it was pleasing to the eye. Eve fixed her eyes on what was forbidden, and soon her heart followed and her will crumbled. There's a reason we sing this little song to our children. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. When Eve and Adam gave in to the temptation to take what they saw, even though they knew it was not for them, their relationship with God was forever damaged. Their greed to want the one thing, only one thing was forbidden, and they were so greedy to take that for themselves that it destroyed the perfect relationship they had with their creator. If only they had fixed their eyes on the one who truly loved them, their hearts would have been turned toward him. A couple months ago, we were on a middle school retreat up at Camp TBRM. And on Saturday night, we had this deeply moving worship experience where the students were asked to mill around and to use their eyes to take in the signs and the images of brokenness in their world, in their schools, in the community, in our country. And then they were given the opportunity to think about ways that they could make Jesus visible as 6th, 7th, and 8th graders in their world today. After most of the students had moved back and started singing, one, I noticed, came up to me. And with tears in his eyes, he looked at me and said, Ruthie, I'm, I'm looking at all this brokenness. Why? Why does this all have to be broken? And as my own throat started to close up a little bit, I looked back at him and said, well, what do you think, buddy? He kind of shrugged his shoulders and he thought and he said, sin? Sin? I said, yeah, I know it sounds simple, I know it sounds trite, but you're absolutely right. Ever since the fall, everything's been broken. And then he started to get really teary and he said, but why? Why can't we live the way God wants us to live? And I could see his heart was breaking for what breaks God's heart. I had talked to them earlier about those words that had been used by the founder of World Vision, that when he went overseas, he wanted to have his heart broken with what breaks God's heart. And I said to him, you know, Adam and Eve walked with God face to face, day in and day out, and they couldn't resist the temptation to take what was not theirs to have. And people have been doing the same thing ever since. That's why we need a Savior. So friends, when we listen to these words from our Savior, and when we look specifically at his instructions in verses 29 and 30, it's helpful for us to realize that Jesus does not mean these harsh words literally. He is speaking in extreme hyperbole to get our attention. 
The other important thing to watch for is the smallest word in those verses, the word if. If what you are looking at causes you to sin, then stop looking at it. If what you are doing or touching causes you to sin, then stop doing it. Jesus doesn't mean for us to never look at one another, to never touch one another, but to guard ourselves in our relationships so that we never enter into any kind of moment that would lead us to sin. But he calls us to have healthy relationships. In his book, Christian Ethics, Gordon Conwell President Dennis Hollinger writes about several studies that have been done recently on these issues. One study revealed that 25% of married men, 15% of married women have admitted to extramarital affairs. In another study, those numbers were 37 and 22%. And of course, that depends on who told the truth as they were being questioned. Because people today, just as in Jesus' day, will want to hem and haw and fudge and say, well, what do you really mean by being unfaithful? Men and women, hear me in this. Infidelity takes many different forms, not exclusively the explicit act of intimacy with someone who is not your spouse. But there are emotional affairs, cyber relationships, inappropriate texting, and time spent viewing inappropriate material on the internet, which is now a multi-billion dollar industry. Hollinger goes on to address this particular subject. He writes, it is the most frequently searched topic on the internet with 68 million hits per day. 25% of all internet searches are looking for this kind of material. And in the United States alone, it's a $13 billion industry. Imagine the health care we could provide for that. Imagine the food we could provide, the homes we could build, if we would take our eyes off that material. Hollinger also reports that 80% of all 15 to 17-year-olds have already, 80% of them have already had multiple exposures to this material. And the youngest average age of the first viewing of this is at age 11. Men and women realize that our middle school and high school students have the internet at their fingertips daily to pull up whatever they want, whenever they want it, with whoever they happen to be with. And so parents, you need to put boundaries around their usage of the computers and the phones. And some parents will say to me, oh, but you know, I trust my son, I trust my daughter, and I don't want them to think I'm just being a mean, old, fuddy-duddy, and, and that, that, I, that I have to put these boundaries. I don't want them to get mad at me. Well, take the risk. What I would say, it's better for you to endure a little bit of them being angry with you for putting boundaries around them than for their souls to be in jeopardy by viewing this material and getting sucked into this world that now is scientifically proven is rewiring the brains of many of our young men and women. And it is addictive, as addictive as drug or alcohol use. And students who are sitting here going, Ruthie, please don't tell my parents to check my phone. I don't care if you get mad at me because I love you way more than these internet providers love you. And I care about what happens to you and what you feed your mind and what you feast your eyes upon. John Stott, a New Testament scholar who wrote an entire volume on the Sermon on the, Round, on the Mount, closes this section with these words. We hold to a principle that eternity is more important than the moment, that purity is more important than the cultural norm, that everybody's doing it. You don't have to be married to live together and sleep together. We have to decide, Stott says, whether to live for this world or the next, to follow the crowd or to follow Jesus. Friends, when we choose to follow Jesus, when we fix our eyes on him, then our hearts are turned to him, and he becomes what we want. And he leads some of us into biblical marriages where we are able to demonstrate and to model and to show 
the image of God that God placed in humanity as male and female. And for those who are single, God calls you to be chaste in your singleness. But he also calls all of us together, men and women, young and old, into healthy and loving relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ because we form his body, the church. And together we can make Jesus visible in a culture where love and intimacy is so grossly distorted. Friends, that's what real love looks like. That's what real love looks like. What the Son of God did for you and for me upon the cross. To reunite us back into a relationship with our Creator. That was God's design from the moment Eve reached out and plucked that fruit. God had this rescue plan in mind because that's how much He loves us. So come to the table and take a look. Take a long look. Feast your eyes on the body and the blood of Christ given for you. And watch your heart be turned to him as well. Amen.